What happened to Hannah Cornelius and Cheslin March is something straight out of a horror movie. All they wanted to do was have a fun little night as best friends after a long week of studying at university, but instead they were kidnapped and put through 11 hours of the most horrific torture. So terrifying, it's beyond comprehension how there are human beings walking this earth who are capable of putting another person through such terror. But before we get into the case, if you are a glasses wearer, you're going to want to hear from today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. If you haven't already heard, GlassesUSA.com is one of the biggest eyewear retailers in the U.S., offering thousands of eyeglasses and sunglasses, offering pretty much any style and color of glasses you can imagine. And the best part about GlassesUSA.com is the price point. Glasses start at just $39, which is up to 70% off of retail prices. They offer some of my favorite in-house brands, such as Amelia E, which is the super cute pair that I'm wearing right now. I also have this pair of Amelia E sunglasses, but they also offer designer brands like Gucci, Oakley, and Ray-Ban, which is another one of my favorite brands. I have these super cute sunglasses in their rose gold color, which I have been loving. But if you're like me and you normally wear contacts throughout the day and your glasses at night, don't worry, they've got you covered. GlassesUSA.com is also the perfect place to stock up and save on your contact lenses. You can get 25% off of all contact brands, including Vista, AccuV, Dailies, BioInfinity, which is what I wear, and so many more. They are available with any prescription and for all uses. Now, when it comes to online shopping, the endless choices can feel overwhelming, but GlassesUSA.com also offers a virtual try-on tool, which makes it so much easier to figure out what style of glasses you like and what looks best on you. Also, shopping online at GlassesUSA.com is risk-free, with free shipping and returns with 100% money-back guarantee within 14 days. So, give GlassesUSA.com a try for yourself. They are offering a crazy discount on top of the coupon code that they already have on their website just for you guys. It's only available for 24 hours, so click the links at the top of my description box to get all of the details. Thank you again so much to GlassesUSA.com for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, I am going to take off my glasses for the remainder of the video. I know that the glare is bothersome for some people and I will be putting in my contacts so I can still see everything that's going on. Okay, with that being said, let's get into the case. This is Hannah and Cheslin's story. Hannah Cornelius was born on February 12, 1996 in Cape Town, South Africa to parents Willem and Anna Cornelius, and she had a younger brother who I don't believe has been named, but he was diagnosed with autism. By all accounts, Hannah and her little brother were raised in a stable, loving home with parents who were decently well off and who loved their children to bits. Hannah's parents said that from the time she was just a baby, Hannah was an easy child. She was known to have a very kind and caring nature, never causing anyone around her any difficulties or drama. She was responsible, diligent, and compassionate. She was very level-headed, and it even got to the point when, as a child, she would have a say in important family matters because of how fair and level-headed she was. For Hannah's 16th birthday, she told her family that she didn't want gifts or money. She said that she couldn't, in good conscience, spend money on herself while the people around her were living in poverty. Instead, she opted to make gift packs for children of the Red Hill informal settlement. She continued this tradition for every birthday after. Now, both Hannah's parents worked in law. Willem worked as a magistrate in a neighboring town. For those of you who don't know what that is, because I certainly didn't, a magistrate is a civil officer who holds some power over decision-making in court cases. It's similar to a judge, but they have limited authority over certain issues. Meanwhile, Anna, she worked as a lawyer. Of course, Hannah's parents always wanted her to pursue some sort of career in law, but she wanted to go a different direction with her life. When Hannah applied to the University of Stellenbosch, Hannah told her parents that she wanted to major in something that would allow her to have a job that would actually really help people, people who really needed it most. So she wanted to earn her bachelor's degree in humanities. Specifically, she majored in languages, literature, and philosophy. Then she wanted to go on to attend postgraduate school. 
Overall, her parents were incredibly proud for the amazing, genuine, kind young woman that Hannah was becoming. A few months after applying to the University of Stellenbosch, Hannah was accepted and thus she was launched into her studies. She stayed at a nearby woman's residence and drove her grandmother's old Volkswagen car to get to and from school. After starting school, Hannah excelled in her studies and in her social life. She made tons of friends and did well in her classes. While in university, Hannah met Cheslin March, a 22-year-old who quickly became her closest friend. He too was a hardworking, down-to-earth student and he and Hannah got along incredibly well. The two helped each other through classes and spent their free time together going to dance clubs or just chilling together after a long day. To note, there were never any romantic feelings between them. They were just best friends who loved to spend time together. On the evening of Friday, May 27th, 2017, Hannah Cheslin and a group of other friends went out for the night. They all got drinks together, played games like dominoes as a group, and they all had a good time like they always did when the group hung out. The night turned into the morning and sometime after midnight, now going into May 28th, things slowed down and the group was getting ready to end their night. At the time, Cheslin and Hannah decided to leave and head home. Now, the area where the university is located is well known for not being the safest area for women to be out walking around alone at night. So, of course, Cheslin offered to walk Hannah home and she accepted. Cheslin walked her home, holding his longboard in hand. They arrived to her place with no issues, but when they got to her residence, Hannah got worried about Cheslin. She didn't think it was safe for him to ride his longboard back home by himself at night. Again, she knew how dangerous the streets could be, not just for women, but for anybody alone at night. So, Hannah insisted that she drive him home in her Volkswagen City Golf. Of course, she figured that even though she would be driving home alone after dropping Cheslin off, it was much safer for her to be in a car alone than for Cheslin to be on his longboard alone. He would be a lot more exposed than Hannah would be in her car. So, they hopped in Hannah's car and drove to Cheslin's home, arriving near the Lavanda Flats by 3.23 a.m. This next part of what happened is actually caught on CCTV footage from that parking lot. So once Hannah parked the car, the two sat and chatted for a while. But as that was happening, CCTV footage captures four men walking into the parking lot before they hide behind a truck that is parked nearby. Two of them then go over to Hannah's car and surround and ambush Cheslin and Hannah. By 3.33 a.m., one of the men ripped open the driver's side door of the car where Hannah was sitting. One of the men pointed a screwdriver in Hannah's face to threaten her, so Cheslin tried grabbing the weapon, but as he did that, another man got into the back seat of the car and threatened Cheslin with a knife from behind. After that, the other three men started piling into the car. One of the men, who I will now name as Nashville Julius, quickly grabbed Cheslin's cell phone and wallet from him before fleeing the scene. As far as we know, that is the entirety of Nashville's involvement in all of this. Now, at that point, Hannah was begging for the other three men to just take what they wanted and leave. They were talking about taking the car, saying that they wanted to sell it, and Hannah would have let them have whatever they wanted. All she wanted was for her and Cheslin to survive this. But that isn't what happened. After Nashville Julius fled with the phone and wallet, one of the men then forced Cheslin into the back seat where one of the men sat with him. So now the seating situation was that Hannah was still shoved between the two front seats, but now she was stuck between two of these assailants while Cheslin was in the back seat sitting by another one of the assailants. After that, the five of them drove away in Hannah's Volkswagen. After they drove off, we don't know the exact movements of the car for about an hour after this as they were not caught on CCTV footage during that time. But at some point in this hour, the assailants stopped the car and forced Cheslin to get out and pushed him into the trunk of the car. As that was happening, they stole everything off of him they could, including his debit card, his jacket, and his shoes. Now, Hannah was by herself in the main part of the car with the three kidnappers. By 4.34 a.m., the car was captured on CCTV at a local petrol station just outside of the area of Stellenbosch. 
There, one of the men got out of the car and walked into the store where he attempted to withdraw money from an ATM with Cheslin's card. But after several attempts, they weren't able to because they couldn't figure out the pin. It was said in some reports that Cheslin gave the wrong pin in an attempt to prevent them from draining his bank account. After this failed attempt, the man got back into the car with their victims. After that, the kidnappers drove the car to a nearby town called Kryfotain, located about 12 miles outside of Stellenbosch. By the way, I do apologize if I'm pronouncing any of these names wrong. I'm obviously not from South Africa. I tried my best to phonetically spell them out based on how I heard them pronounced, but if I do pronounce them incorrectly, I do apologize in advance. Either way, once they got to Cryfontaine, they made a few different stops with a few different people in the area. They made a few drug pickups and in one of the homes, they brought Hannah inside with them and stayed there for a bit to smoke and do drugs before coming back out to the car and driving off once again. The three men drove around for about an hour total after leaving the gas station before they stopped in a remote area outside of town. By this point, it was around 5.30 a.m. again on May 28th. There, two of the men got out of the car and grabbed Cheslin from the trunk while one of the men remained in the car with Hannah. They forced him to get out of the trunk and walk into the bush. They then forced him to lay on the ground, which he did. In that moment, Cheslin knew that he was going to die. After lying on the ground, he looked up and saw two men standing over him, holding bricks that they had found scattered around the ground. Then, they start viciously beating Cheslin over the head over and over and over again with the bricks until he stopped fighting them and fell unconscious, confident that they had killed him. Now, like I said, Hannah and another man were in that car while the two other men went and beat Cheslin to death. After waiting in the car for about a half hour, the other men came back to the car without Cheslin. The man that was in the car with Hannah asked the two other men what happened, and apparently they said that they tied Cheslin up and were leaving him there so that they could sell the car. They made it sound like he was still alive, that they pretty much just brought him out there, tied him up, and then left so that they had enough time while Cheslin was tied up and, you know, was either figuring out how to get out or until someone found him. That's pretty much how they made it seem. So the two men then got back into the car and off they drove. They headed back to a shack in Cryfontein where two of the men went inside before coming back out to continue their journey. It's once again assumed that this was some sort of drug pickup or they just stopped to do drugs or something like that. They then started heading back towards Stellenbosch. On their way, they stopped at this abandoned paintball facility where they knew they would be alone. There, Hannah was terrified. She was trying her best to bargain with these men, begging for her life. But in that moment, she knew she was going to be raped. There was no way out of it. So she told the men that she wouldn't struggle if they raped her. She promised not to tell anyone. She just wanted to live so they could do whatever they wanted to her as long as they let her live. In the horrifying minutes that followed, two of the men forced Hannah out of the car and onto the ground where they took turns raping Hannah. One of the men later claims that he stayed in the car while this was happening so he could smoke his drugs. He said that he watched as the two men raped her, and in that moment, he made eye contact with her. He saw tears in her eyes and the look of horror on her face. After the rapes, Hannah got up and tried putting her jacket back on, but the men then shoved her into the trunk of the car. At that point, she had been promised her life. They assured her, that they were not going to hurt her, but that was a lie. After the rapes, they drove to a vineyard that was located about 12 miles away. By now, it was around 7 a.m. Now, according to later statements, these men said that they didn't actually intend to hurt Hannah. They intended to bring her out to the vineyard and tie her up. They planned on leaving her alive, apparently. That's what they said. But when they opened the trunk of the car, Hannah was terrified. She realized that their promises meant nothing. She refused to get out, so they had to physically pull her out, but she did not come out easily. She was holding on to the car, and she was panicking and freaking out. Because of this, one of the men came up and stabbed her in the neck with the screwdriver, causing her to let go. They then threw her out of the car and onto a pile of gravel. 
As she lied there, helpless and injured, these men found the heaviest rock that they could and smashed her head with the rock, killing her instantly. There, the men left Hannah's half-naked body lying dead in the vineyard as they drove away in her car. But they weren't too bothered by what they had just done. These men continued on with their crimes. By around 1 p.m. on May 28th, they had started driving around the area looking for more drugs before they discovered another woman who was walking alone on an isolated street. There, they stopped and robbed her. After robbing this poor woman, the men then continued before they found another woman who was alone and vulnerable. They ambushed this woman as well, shoving her into Hannah's car. They then drove to a nearby petrol station where they successfully withdrew 3,000 rand or about 159 US dollars from an ATM while this terrified woman sat in the back of Hannah's car. According to CCTV footage from this continued spree, the men appeared to be calm and unbothered. They weren't frenzied or panicked after beating and fully believing they killed two people just hours prior. After getting the money from the ATM, thankfully, they did release this woman. Thankfully, neither of these other two women that they attacked were seriously injured. Now, while all of that was happening, by around 6 a.m. the following day on May 29th in the area of Kreinfinten, there was a couple who lived in one of the more rural areas who went outside on their farm only to hear the faint sounds of a sort of moaning sound. That noise turned into a yell, and at that point, it was clear that someone was calling for help. They looked around the area in the bush to see where the sound was coming from, and that is when they spotted a young man who had clearly been severely beaten. He was absolutely covered in blood, barely able to stand, stumbling around as he made his way towards the couple, still begging for help. At first, the couple thought that this was maybe some gangster who was up to no good, but after seeing his condition and hearing his desperate pleas, they soon realized the gravity of the situation. They called 911 and flagged down a passing car who stopped and transported the man to a nearby hospital for treatment. If you haven't guessed by now, this man was Cheslin Marsh. Miraculously, he survived his vicious attack. Cheslin would later say that he remembers the attack. The men were berating him for not giving him the PIN number to his debit card, so that is why they beat him with the bricks. When he woke up hours later, he remembers his first thought being to get help. But when he looked up and looked around, he was surrounded by trees and sand. He was in the middle of nowhere. He got up and started walking in his socks because, again, the men stole his shoes. He felt as glass cut the bottoms of his feet as he wandered. He reached a point where he saw that he was surrounded by high walls, so he knew that he was close to someone who could help him. He said he was so weak, he had no idea how, but he did end up climbing over those walls. He made his way into the yard of that couple who spotted him, and as we know, they helped him get a ride to the hospital. He was alive from the attack, but the attack caused significant injuries. His arm was fractured, he had multiple open head wounds, a skull fracture, and brain bleeds. Thankfully, his brain bleeds and skull fractures did heal, but he was left with complete deafness in one ear. That hearing loss is permanent, so he will never hear out of that ear again. But given everything that he suffered, that seems like an okay price to pay given that Cheslin was very, very lucky to survive his injuries at all, and for the most part, he gained most of his function back. A lot of people with head injuries that severe will not be able to walk. They might not be able to talk, and they might have very, very limited function for the rest of their lives, but thankfully, Cheslin was lucky enough to gain back most of his function, obviously besides his hearing, which is a devastating loss. At the hospital, Cheslin spoke with police, informing them of what he went through. He gave the descriptions of what happened that night, as well as of the men who were responsible for what happened. He desperately wanted to help them find his friend. However, it was around this time that he found out 
that Hannah had already been found. A few hours before Cheslin woke up, there were two pump technicians who were sent out to repair some piping at a farm in Stellenbosch on the morning of Friday, May 27th, the morning before Hannah and Cheslin were kidnapped. Once they fixed the piping that day, they placed a large rock over the hole that they dug to ensure that nothing fell into it overnight. That next morning, on Saturday, May 28th, the men returned to the area to finish the job. But when they got there, they found that the rock that they had placed over the hole had been removed. So, the men obviously went closer to the area to inspect what happened. This rock was very heavy. I believe it was around 80 pounds. So, it was way too heavy for someone to have just knocked it over or for it to have been just picked up by a random person for no reason. Like, it's not one of those rocks that you would just pick up and, you know, throw into a pond. So, these workers knew that something odd was going on. As they got closer to where the rock should have been, they also saw what looked like rags scattered around the field. So, they went around and picked up the rags, but as they did that, they saw someone lying on the ground in the middle of that vineyard. At first, of course, as we always hear in cases like this, these men thought it was a doll. But as they got closer, they found that it was a dead woman lying on the ground with her pants pulled halfway down. Of course, they called the authorities who came to remove her body, and of course, this body was identified as belonging to Hannah Cornelius. At that point, police were on high alert for a carjacking involving Hannah's blue Volkswagen. They made sure to stay diligent and keep on the lookout for her car, knowing if they found her car, they would find the men responsible for her brutal murder. And by around 2 p.m. on May 28th, two undercover officers spotted Hannah's car and followed the now two suspects as they called for backup. Once backup arrived, the suspects tried fleeing, taking the police on a high-speed chase. After about a kilometer of the chase, they ended up on a private farm driveway where they were stopped with a fence. So, they then got out of the car and these two suspects attempted fleeing on foot, one of them even jumping into a nearby creek to get away. But almost immediately, these two suspects were apprehended and arrested. At this time, the two suspects were identified as 27-year-old Geraldo Parsons and 33-year-old Vernon Woodabui. Shortly after these two men were apprehended, they gave up the identities of the other men involved in the robbery, 28-year-old Eben Van Niekirk and, as I mentioned before, 29-year-old Nashville Julius. Upon identifying these men, of course, police learned that each of these men had extensive violent criminal histories and they were gang members. After the initial arrests, one of the men, Vernon Wittebui, pretty much made a full confession to the entire thing. And in that confession, he blamed pretty much everything that happened on his co-defendants. Vernon told officers that on the night of the kidnappings, Vernon got a taste for smoke, aka he wanted to do drugs. So he met up with his friends Eben Van Niekirk and Geraldo Parsons. As they all smoked, they got the idea to go into town to see what they could find. As they headed into town, they picked up another friend who they called Pikes, but who we know as Nashville Julius. After picking up Nashville, the four men were patrolling the streets of Stellenbosch when they saw Hannah chatting with Cheslin and her blue Volkswagen. He said that they approached the car with the idea of robbing them of their cell phone and wallets. Geraldo started by diving into the back passenger side window to grab Cheslin while Vernon got in the front seat and took out the keys. Julius took Cheslin's cell phone and wallet before leaving, as I stated earlier. Then, as we know, the three men put Cheslin in the trunk and tried using his debit card to get the money, but they couldn't. While driving, Vernon said that he noticed Geraldo had a firearm, but he hadn't known that previously, he just noticed it in that moment. At some point in the night, the men then met back up with Nashville to get more drugs, but again, as far as we know, he didn't take any more part in harming Cheslin or raping and murdering Hannah. After doing more drugs, the three men then drove around doing more drugs in the car while Hannah was sitting with them and Cheslin was in the trunk. Vernon said that Geraldo was driving when they pulled over to that secluded area. Geraldo then took Cheslin to the bushes with Eben. 
So, according to Vernon, he didn't take part in beating Cheslin, it was the two other men. And when they came back, they told him that all they did was tie him up and he believed them. Now, when questioning the other men, they did admit to beating Cheslin and they said that their intention was to kill him. They only left when they thought he was dead. After that, they drove around more, smoked more drugs before stopping again. According to Vernon, Geraldo was the one who brought up having sex with the girl. Vernon said that he told Geraldo that he wasn't about that, he was only there for the money. According to him, Geraldo and Eben were the ones that took Hannah to that secluded area by the paintball building and they took turns raping her. He said that the men came back and told Vernon that he missed out. He said that Geraldo was first and Eben was second. After the rapes, as we know, they drove to a nearby vineyard. Vernon said that Geraldo and Eben took Hannah, who was injured and defenseless, to that vineyard before they hit her with the rock, ending her life. However, Vernon said that the men didn't tell him about hitting her with the rock. They told Vernon that they just tied her up and left her there to be discovered by farmers that following day. As Vernon was telling that part of the story, according to some reports, he started to break down in tears. So to sort of summarize what Vernon said in his confession, he was basically claiming that yes, he took part in the kidnapping and he knew about the rape of Hannah and didn't do anything to stop it but he said that he did not know that the other men attempted to kill Cheslin and he did not know that they killed Hannah. He genuinely thought that they were just tied up and were left there. I personally don't believe this story at all and I don't think investigators did either, but what do you guys think? After hearing this confession and knowing what happened from Cheslin's account, Vernon, Geraldo, and Eben were all charged with multiple counts of aggravated robbery, two charges of kidnapping, one each of rape and murder. Meanwhile, Nashville Julius was charged with two counts each of aggravated robbery and kidnapping. Vernon Wittabui, who again was the one who gave that confession, he pled guilty to charges of robbery and not guilty on all remaining counts. Meanwhile, the other three men each pleaded not guilty to all charges. Over a year after the kidnapping murder and attempted murder occurred by October of 2018, the joint trial for these four men started. It was said that these men didn't take the trial seriously at all. They were seen smiling and laughing and having a good time while court proceedings were taking place. They were all very disrespectful, all blatantly showing that they did not care what was happening. The trial was a pretty solid one regardless. They had the CCTV footage, they had the evidence from Hannah's car, including the screwdriver that was used to stab her, the drugs and paraphernalia, as well as cigarettes they all smoked in the car. They also found used condoms with Eben and Geraldo's DNA on them. They also found evidence from where Hannah's body was found, including the 82-pound rock that was used to hit Hannah over the head. They also had Vernon's confession, and last but not least, they had statements from one of the victims who went through this nightmare. Cheslin Marsh did testify at trial, spelling out everything that happened that horrible, horrible night. On the stand, he was clearly traumatized, looking briefly at each defendant before speaking. He talked about the night that he and Hannah had before he walked her home, only for her to decide to drive him home. He said that Hannah always puts other people's best interests before her own. She had a heart of gold, so that is why she wanted to make sure that Cheslin made it home safely that night. He then talked about the night of horror he endured. He was beaten, left for dead. Then he survived, only to find out that his best friend was raped and murdered. I can't even imagine the absolute terror Cheslin must have felt for years and probably still feels after all of this happened. At the trial, both Vernon and Geraldo testified. Vernon testified to everything that we discussed earlier, basically pinning everything on Geraldo and Eben, saying that Geraldo was the mastermind. Meanwhile, Geraldo testified basically to the opposite. He said that Vernon was the mastermind behind all of it. However, Geraldo did admit to raping Hannah. When admitting this, he showed no remorse for what he actually did. 
But the kicker is, is that Geraldo actually has a girlfriend and two children, hopefully an ex-girlfriend at this point. He said that he only felt bad for raping Hannah in the context of him betraying his family not for the abuse and torture that he put Hannah through. So, based on all of the very solid evidence they presented at trial, the judge found that each of the three men accused of robbery, kidnapping, rape, and murder all played equal roles. It didn't matter if one of them didn't physically kill or rape Hannah, they were all there for it. Each of them let it happen, and then each of them tried to evade capture afterwards. And after all, the words that they spoke were coming from violent criminals, so we truly don't know who, if anyone, is telling the truth. So, it only makes sense to find all three men responsible. So, at the end of the trial, they found Vernon Woodabui, Geraldo Parsons, and Eben Van Niekirk guilty on all charges. Each man was handed a life sentence for his crimes. Meanwhile, Nashville Julius was also found guilty for his roles, which were the kidnapping and robbery. For this, he was given a sentence of 15 years, which I am glad that he was given a relatively harsh sentence, even though he didn't kill or rape anybody. He clearly hung out with some really horrible people and did some really horrible things himself, so I wouldn't put it past him at all to continue committing awful crimes if he was given a shorter sentence. Und das kann das in der Stahl. It is ordered that one, on count one, the robbery with aggravating circumstances of Cheslin Claude Marsh, accused one, two, three, and four are guilty. On count two, the robbery with aggravating circumstances of Hannah Cornelius, accused one, two, three, and four are guilty. On count three, the kidnapping of Cheslin Claude Marsh, accused one, two, three, and four, are guilty. On count four, the kidnapping of Hannah Cornelius, accused one, two, three, and four, are guilty. The Scott has a, five, a fee can sit. On count five, the attempted murder of Cheslin Claude Marsh, accused one, two, and three, are gu guilty. On count six, the murder of Hannah Cornelius, accused one, two, and three, are guilty. On count seven, the rape of Hannah Cornelius, accused one, two, and three, are guilty. Count eight, the robbery with aggravated circumstances of Nkomisa Guiquina, accused one, two, and three are guilty. On count nine, the robbery with aggravated circumstances of Mimi October, accused one, two, and three are guilty. On count ten, the kidnapping of Mimi October, accused one, two, and three are guilty. Marcet. In the aftermath of all of this, obviously, everybody involved is heartbroken. Cheslin is absolutely traumatized. After the trial, he said that he is happy justice has been served and he is ready to put all of this behind him. Obviously, he said that he will still try to carry on Hannah's legacy and keep her name alive. He obviously had to quit school for a while during all of this, but he did start back up and, by all accounts, he excelled in his classes. I feel amazing. I feel like justice has been served on a platter and like with an extra little bit of dessert. So <laughs> there's, not, there's nothing else I can say, but like I'm just quite relieved that this chapter is done of my life now. There were loud cheers when the judge handed down sentence. What has happened to Anna must never happen to another woman again. And we will make sure by every case like this, that as an organization, we will support our women. Meanwhile, about a year after Hannah's tragic murder, her mother, Anna, died by drowning. Her father, Willem, said that while Hannah died, his family died with her. Anna became a shadow of herself, unable to cope with the horrific loss. She walked into the sea one day and drowned. Willem said that he didn't believe she died by suicide, but whatever challenges she faced, she didn't have the strength to fight them. So, when she walked into that ocean, when she was taken under, she didn't have the strength to fight it. Which is just so horrendous and so honestly chilling to even say, because that gives us an even better insight into what these families truly go through after they lose a loved one like they did. Another tragic part of this case is that Hannah's younger brother still has trouble understanding what happened to his sister, like I said, he was diagnosed with autism, and there are still times, according to Willem, where he will still ask his father where Hannah is and why she isn't home. And he still has to remind his son and remind himself that Hannah will never be coming home. Her 16th birthday fell shortly after her backpacking trip to India with her mother. 
And when you ask her what she would like to have for a birthday party or a birthday present, she informed us that she could not in good conscience spend money on herself while people around her were living in poverty. She made and we accepted a proposal to rather make up gift bags for the children in the nearby informal settlement. This was also how she celebrated her subsequent birthdays at home. When she enrolled in the University of Stellenbosch, Anna informed us, I must admit somewhat to our dismay, that she had absolutely no interest in pursuing a career in law. According to her, she wanted to do something that would actually help people. It wasn't quite clear exactly how she intended to achieve her, that aim, but she presented a well thought out and eloquently argued plan for a future. She would major in languages, literature, and philosophy, which she loved, and then pursue postgraduate studies in France. The theme of helping was a constant in her life, and I understand it may have led indirectly to the reason why we are here today. If that is indeed the case, then I'm even more proud of her. Me and her mother were immensely proud of raising a child for the new South Africa. My wife, in addition to being my best friend, was the strongest and most competent person I've ever met. She became a shadow of herself, unconscionable, frantic, almost manic in everything she did. Outwardly still in control, but inside she had very little to give. No one really knows what happened on that early morning when she decided to go swimming in an ice-cold and stormy Atlantic Ocean. For myself, I do not believe that she committed suicide or she ended herself. But what I do believe is that she did not have the physical or mental strength left to counter any difficulties that she may have experienced. My son, Andres, does not understand the concept of death. Every night when I put him to bed, he stops in front of a framed photograph of Hannah and asks, when our day is over, when is she coming home? This has now been going on every night for a year and a half. Overall, this is just a horrible, awful case. What Hannah went through in her final moments is straight out of a nightmare, and it's something that nobody should ever have to live through. I don't understand why these monsters couldn't just let her go after they got their money. I don't understand how or why it escalated the way they did. Hannah's life could have been spared. They could have just taken her damn car like they wanted, but instead, these subhuman pieces of garbage took it way too far and tortured a young woman who had so much potential, so much life to live. They are disgusting, low-life pieces of trash, and I hope that they rot behind bars for the rest of their lives. But that is all I have for today's video, and as always, I want to hear what you all think about this case. Why do you think it escalated the way it did? Why couldn't they just let them go? Do you think these men truly went in with the intention of just robbing them? Or do you think that they wanted to murder the both of them all along? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on. Also, don't forget to use the link down below and head to glassesusa.com to check out their exclusive offers now. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also linked down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.